I've got a whiskey in hand, I've got my headphones on, and uh, I've got Pete on the Zoom, and that can mean only one thing. It must be Season 2, Episode 2 of the Constant Geekery Podcast. Welcome, everybody. Hello, and slap me with a wet kipper. I'm sure you've done that before. Try many, and, try many and mix times. it up a bit, Pete. Maybe you introduce some other sea creatures into your slapping. <laughs> I th- well, suck my face with a giant squid. That'll do. We'll, we'll start with that. Let's roll the credits. Okay. So, uh, we're obviously still in lockdown here in the UK, and uh, that means that we do our podcast on Zoom, and the side benefit to that is, of course, that I get my my glass of whiskey. Uh, and this week, of course, I'm sure you'll be very interested to know, but I'm going with um, some Cardu, can you see that? Yeah, there we go, Cardu Gold Reserve. Of course, I'm, I'm saying, can you see that? But you can't see it if you're listening to us on iTunes or Spotify or something like that. Uh, but if you were to go to youtube.com forward slash constant geekery and then follow the link to the separate podcast channel, uh, you could watch the podcast and then you would actually see our faces. No so one recommends on that. Maybe just carry on listening on uh, Spotify <laughs> or iTunes. It might, might be best. Yeah. Uh, how's your day been, Pete? And uh, uh, do you have a, 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 some sort of exciting drink there? My day has been like pretty much every other day since we went into this lockdown, which is to say Groundhog Day. Um, nothing really to differentiate it. But to answer your second question, I do have some unicorn fuel this evening, according to my mug. It's a unicorn fuel mug, uh, which is uh, excitingly filled. Uh, as regular listeners will know, I don't drink. Um, this is regularly filled, uh, so this is just filled with water. Excellent. Good. Well, yeah. uh, enjoy, enjoy that water. I, you know what, Pete? I've, I've had a lovely day today. Uh, I got out for my government approved unit of uh, socially distanced exercise and uh, got very very muddy in the process with the boys and my wife uh, so that was very nice and then we watched the greatest movie that has ever been made smoking the bandit no oh. oceans 11 no the shawshank redemption we could be here all night so it, obviously it's back to the future oh yeah okay yeah i, I won't disagree with you that is in in definitely in my top movie choices excellent and uh perhaps you don't agree with me in which case um send through your suggestions uh, you can send them to i'm wrong at constant because uh, <laughs> they will be given beats... they will be given the attention they deserve that's it nothing beats back to the future and we were going to start off by just talking about some of the highlights from ces 2021 yeah, yeah, there's there's many, some of which are not really repeatable in this podcast, some really interesting technology, which I'm not going to share here. Um, but a few highlights. Uh, the Samsung, we've obviously been talking a lot about Apple's corporate and social responsibility when it comes to the environment and recycling and how it's a bit of a wheeze, we feel, in some ways. But Samsung have brought out uh, an eco-remote control, and this will be shipping with all their new QLED 4K and 8K uh, TVs in 2021. So unlike most traditional TV remotes, it doesn't use single-use batteries, either double A's or AAA's, which you know, end up in landfill or down the side of your sofa when you drop it and it inve- inve- inevitably splits apart. Um, it can charge using a USB-C charge cable or light. Mm-hmm. Light? Yeah. What, as yeah, in so switch solar. the light on and your remote control charges up? Sort of solar. Why yeah, didn't you just put solar in the notes and then I'd have known what you meant? Well, it's, uh, it made for an interesting interplay of discussion. I, because, yeah. I'm, there, I'm there imagining some kind of like super futuristic laser technology and what you're actually <laughs> talking about is a, the solar panel that used to feature on your calculator back in the, in the 1980s. 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you used to be able to bring it back to life just by shining a light on it. But what a... Yeah, what what an innovation, any solar charging. That's, uh, but that's they, they they say it can last on a single charge for around about 2 years. So, that's pretty good. It might actually last longer than the actual TV based on how quickly people recycle their TVs these days. Um but I, what I, do you think? I still don't have a 4K TV, Pete. So, um I'm not the demographic for this. I, what do I think? Well, um, step in the right direction. Yeah, possibly. Um, you know, remote control batteries. You know, it's not like you go through lots of them, is it? Well, I suppose it depends how much TV you watch. I don't watch a lot, so no. 
Yeah, so it's not like there's a lot of landfill. There is recycling for those things. And I, I do wonder where's all, where are all of these lithium-ion batteries going to go when they've they've ended their usefulness. I suppose they'll just get recycled as well in some way. But um, yeah, Elon Musk will bring out some kind of Tesla that will use them. I mean, it, it, I'm sure... <laughs> I, I'm just sort of thinking, well, isn't this what Apple already do with their Apple remote? Yes. Like the one yeah, I've got with has, my Apple TV, and I'm sure yeah. I've only charged it twice in all the time I've owned it. Yeah. No, they do. That's got a lightning charger on it, and uh, mm. that's good. But I just thought, you know, you could think of it as a step in the right direction, or you could think of it as a, a cynical corporate um, effort to stay relevant at CES 2021 with something that they should be doing anyway. Oh, so... Yeah, I mean, that is more interesting rather than the product itself. It's that Samsung is shouting about it as some kind of eco-revelation, are they? Yeah, well, it was a highlight. I, I don't know how much of a, a fuss they made about it. It was one of the things that was highlighted as one of the, the most innovative products. And I'm not sure I would call it innovative. I think it's a good idea. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Hmm. Um, but maybe too much focus put on it. Well, speaking of amazing and innovative <laughs> products, Pete, let's move on to the next one that you, you highlighted for review. Yeah, I thought this, this one did make me chuckle. This is the Yves Saint Laurent. Who, who knew Yves Saint Laurent, the, the fashion brand, are getting into technology with their, uh, I apologise if I butcher this, the Beauté Rouge Sur Mesure, which is basically a Bluetooth-enabled lipstick with a mixing pod. So you get three, you get three shades or three colours um, that you can basically mix within this mixing pod, um, uh, and you you've got an app, so you can hold it up to your face and do a selfie, and you can go through a colour wheel and try different shades to match what you're wearing or or your tonals or your colours or that. I'm sure people who wear lipstick will understand that a bit more. I me mean, not so much, um, but the it's also RFID re enabled so when you start running out of particular colors you can order a top up a bit like a a printer subscription so basically right. it's it's a makeup printer okay so uh, okay i, I want to i want to talk about this I, and i have to i have to acknowledge as well that um some somewhere around one percent of our audience is indeed of the female persuasion um you know, that's a story of my life, really, ever popular with the ladies. Uh, nothing changes. <laughs> uh, so I am i don't know how many of you chaps out there are, are interested in, in popping on some lipstick. Perhaps uh, perhaps some of you, like Pete, do like to do that occasionally. Um, you rotter. Here's, here's, here's my question, Pete. Uh, apart from all the obvious stuff, like, of course, they've RFID enabled the refill so they can make sure they're genuine and that you're not putting any any old stuff in there so that they can <laughs> charge some exorbitant amount for the refills. Um, now, go on. Uh, you tell me the price first, Pete. What, how much is this thing? It's yours for $299. Oh, and how much, do, how much does a lipstick cost? Uh, I, I don't know. Probably if, base, if it was based on normal printers, but probably about $500. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so I suspect the refills will cost a lot of money. But mm. I, I would have thought that the average um, person who wants to wear some lipstick can go to the drugstore and probably pick up a lipstick for... The lipstick shop. I, I don't know, shall we say $5? to five dollars? Am I completely wrong there? But I don't, that sounds like the kind of price that one might pay for something like that. And We are so out of touch, but carry on. <laughs> Well, look, here's my, here's my thinking, right? Okay, most most ladies that I know have a limited number of shades of lipstick that they would actually choose to wear. Yeah. There are those who like to, I like to experiment with a, a veritable rainbow of different colours. But most most women, they get they sort of hone in on the shades that work for them and they kind of stick to their particular shade. So what is yeah. the point in having something that can mix any possible shade if you know inevitably once you've found your shade you're probably just going to stick with it so why not just simply use the app find the shade then go to the drugstore where there is a rainbow of lipsticks available and spend your five dollars on one i don't know i just thought it was cool and it made me think of that film i don't know if you have have you seen the fifth element it's quite an old film now 
Big fan. Fifth element. There, there's a point in that where um, the main character, played by Mila Jovovich, puts this thing on her. It looked like one of those VR games from the 1980s, but she puts it on her face like that, and she cycles through different coloured makeup, eye, eye makeup, and it just made me think of that, and it made me think, we are living in our future from our childhood, and I thought that was cool, but that's about as far as I thought with it. You've obviously analysed it more than me. But I've got to be honest, go. Pete, out, out of that film, it's the flying car that would have been more of a, a kind of significant thing for me that would would signify that we are indeed living in the future rather See, than perhaps the, the makeup. Yeah, yeah, CES did have some of those as concepts on show as well, but um, yeah, who who knows? It's a bit of a mix. Anyway, anyway, do you think we should actually move on to the meat of our podcast? Because we're here rudely at 14 minutes, and I'm sure <laughs> people are starting to to lose the will to live. Maybe we should bookmark some points in this one as well, if you don't want to know about Bluetooth-enabled makeup. I think everybody wants to know about Bluetooth-enabled makeup, Pete. I can't <laughs> see anything wrong with that whatsoever. No. Um, look, something serious did come out of uh, CES, and uh, that is that AMD announced their new mobile chips that are mm. based on the Ryzen 5000. Now, I know a lot of our audience are more of an Apple persuasion, um, but what you should know about this is that the, the desktop Ryzen 5000 chips are offering performance at the level of the M1. Okay. Uh, including single core. You know, that that there's some serious, seriously powerful chips. In fact, they go, when it comes to multi-core, they go well beyond the performance of the M1. Cool. My question is, or what I'm, what I'm hoping is that AMD will have made these chips in such a way that we're going to get PC laptops with equivalent performance to the M1. Okay. Yeah, I can see that as a possibility, and that's quite exciting, isn't it? Um, and when you talk about performance, you're not talking just about raw output, but you know, con comparable battery life and things like that, maybe as well. Yeah, whether I mean they 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 are getting much longer battery lives uh, now. I I don't think the the M1 laptops are as far ahead of PCs as as everyone makes out. I mean, AMD have kind of shifted up the game. Intel are falling a, a bit behind in this particular area. Um, but certainly these these chips have the potential to equal it. Uh, mm. Now, what I will say is the previous generation of mobile Ryzen uh, doesn't get quite up to the level of the M1 when it comes to single core performance. But, okay. you know, there's a whole bunch of SKUs, and we're talking eight core x86 processors with serious horsepower here. Um, and, you know, I think that that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, Asus have got a whole lineup of great new laptops. I mean, it's great news for gamers who want laptops. Um, yeah, but and good I for mean, creatives who use PC as well to have something mobile that that can actually compete. And I, I just want to say this one more thing is that, of course, you can combine that with a decent GPU. Uh, okay, because I was going to rebuff this by saying that's all good, but you haven't got with any PC, the end-to-end -end optimization of software and hardware like you have with Apple Silicon, have you? So is it really ever going to give you the same kind of performance? And you know, most creatives, as you know, I'm making a massive generalization there, a lot of creatives are already in Apple's ecosystem. Um, so, yeah, I get it for gamers, but you're not going to have the same level of optimization that you would do with Apple. Um, no, I think that's probably a fair point. But I think that's also a double-edged sword. Or maybe we can... We, well, uh, it sets an expectation of performance. So, you know, the, the M1 performs extraordinarily well in Final Cut Pro, as you would mm -hmm. expect, you know, working with ProRes. Um, Apple has optimized it for that. Um, uh, but that then sets an expectation that, you know, you can edit video real really quickly on it and that that kind of performance is going to be present in in all aspects of the system and it's not you know there are areas where the m1 is not optimized and it, it it actually isn't a great experience i mean not many areas i'll grant you um you know don't get me wrong here the m1 is is an absolutely fantastic product um so i i just think apple set that expectation you know at wwdc they were they shouted about video editing and i'm, I'm sure everyone's sick of hearing about video editing in the m1 but that's what apple yeah, they, they, it, showed, they? they showed that 4K stream with the instant effects being applied while it was running. And we were all, because we were watching that live, we were blown away by that. That looks so exciting. And I wonder, 
you know, a lot of people are saying we're we're trying with some of the tests we've done. Obviously, we've done videos uh, both together and you've done some on your own of um, different codecs, different videos, how quick they are to render versus um, other Apple machines uh, and DaVinci and Final Cut Pro. Um, but ultimately, the M1 lineup is a consumer unit. It's a consumer-based laptop. It is not really intended for heavyweight video editing. But I think you've hit the nail on the head there that Apple kind of marketed it that way. Uh, and therefore, they've set the bar with a level of expectation. And we're seeing this in comments on uh, last season's podcast um, as well, that a lot of pros are saying, well, I should be able to use this. And I am using it for editing you know, footage that you wouldn't normally expect to be editing. Uh, in s any kind of serious anger on a machine of this this price point. Oh, yeah, and I, and I don't dispute that at all. I, I've got to say, actually, you know, I'm, I edited a number of videos on the channel on the, the M1 Mini that, uh, in fact, I'm using it right now to record our, our podcast audio. Um, and uh, it was, for the most part, a good experience. You know, mm. but I, they, these weren't particularly taxing videos. And uh, what I noticed was that, you know, it only takes, it, it seems to me, a little thing like, um, you know, adding some titles, you know, putting a drop shadow on something or, you know, when you start to layer things up or, or put a color grade on, then it, it starts to struggle. Yeah. And the simple reason for that is that it's lacking GPU horsepower. And, uh, you know, video editing traditionally is, you know, there are the areas where you get the specially optimized chips, you know, for the particular consumer highly compressed video codecs like HEVC and the M1 is utterly unbelievable for working with HEVC for what it is um, but traditionally it's all about RAM and GPU horsepower and the M1 doesn't give you the ability to upgrade your RAM and you can't spec it with a with you know a really sensible amount of RAM and uh, of course again lots of people are saying well you can still you can use it you know you can use the 8-gig model and the 16-gig model and blah, blah, blah. Well, yes, you can use it for basic video edits, it's, but we're, we're not talking about that. We're talking about when things get complicated, you know, with professional codecs and, and things. Uh, and let's be clear here, you know, Apple demonstrated this particular computer, even though it's a consumer computer, with a professional codec. It was mm. ProRes feeds yep. that they were talking about. Um, and there's no way to upgrade the, the GPU. You know, Apple haven't uh, provided eGPU support either because they don't want to or because they can for some reason and you know yeah again i fully accept that going out and buying an eGPU and a graphics card is a very expensive acquisition but it, it's a nice upgrade to have a nice upgrade path to have and a lot of people have older macs with eGPUs yeah. and they would like to upgrade to an m1 machine and continue using their eGPU but that's just not possible at the moment so what you're saying really is um the, the lack of an upgrade path in the M1 ecosystem, and that's probably going to be true with M1X and M2 to a degree, although we'll have to see with the, the Mac Pros when they come out what sort of upgrade paths you get with those. You'd expect them to have one. But the lack of an upgrade path makes, for some, a Windows machine more, more enticing, particularly if you've got these new Ryzen-based chips that are going to bring the performance very close to M1, or maybe even exceed it in some cases. Yeah, I don't see why it couldn't exceed it um, until Apple bring out the next generation, you know, and then it's, uh, it's we'll be back to the drawing board again. But um, I wasn't really suggesting that um, folks who are on Apple or who were considering, you know, buying an Apple M1 would then turn around and go and buy a PC because it offers the same performance. And I think those kind of arguments actually don't make any sense. You know, you I hear it all the time, you know, you, you, you quite often get the, the PC fanboys on the channel and, you know, they'll drop a comment like, go and build a PC for, you know, much less money and all the rest of it, completely glossing over the the other, you know, compelling arguments like, you know, you might be a professional who's actually required to use software that only runs on Mac OS. Yep. And, of course, then you get the Hackintosh argument. Well, that's not what professionals do. You know, professionals mm. pay a lot of money for professional-grade equipment and support for that equipment. That's that's what they're interested in. Yeah. Um, so I, what I'm saying here is that it's great for people who use PCs anyway. I, you know, we don't want to be in a situation where the fastest computer in the world is an Apple. Uh, 
when I'm well, what that, I mean by that is that the stifles Apple's... choice, doesn't it? That stifles choice and it stifles options. Yeah. Do we do we want to give Apple the corporation total control and domination over the computer market? I I don't see that as being a great thing at all. Competition mm. is far better. Whether yeah. whether you, even if you're never going to use a Windows machine in your life you should still be happy that there are powerful Windows machines out there because it keeps competition strong. And whilst competition yeah. exists, then you've got consumer choice. And it, Apple will be the first people to take away consumer choice if they if they can at all manage it. Yeah. I mean, we've seen that to a degree in a, in a completely different industry, which is the search engine industry, where everyone uses Google. And, you know, it it, it takes away various things because of the omnipotence of Google. It's not a good thing for the internet, I would say. Um, so yeah, having having that competition is good for everyone. And you know, at the end of the day, we both both of us use Windows machines. We use Mac machines, as as the job requires it. And they both have their good points. So yeah, I'm pleased about it as well. I thought for a minute, I might be sensing overtones of you becoming a bit of a almost an M1 hater. But I think you've maybe explained that that's not the case. No, I'd, I'm not an M1 hater. I'm disappointed. I, I, I mean, we got very excited. Anyone who watched our, you know, us talking about it in the roll-up, you know, we we were very excited about this new era for computing. But, um, and let's make no mistake here, still excited about it. The, the raw performance of that M1 chip is mind-blowing. And where Apple are going to take it next, who knows? It's going to be yeah. fantastic. The computer science behind it is great, isn't it? Fantastic, but it's the other bits that go with it that have um, led to a bit of disappointment. So I think I'd, you know, let's talk about that for a moment. Okay. Um, I don't like Apple's corporate behaviour, and that we just see more and more of it. You know, these these computers are non-upgradable, mm. and there are those who'll say that's a good thing. I should imagine they're in the minority. You know, most most people want an upgrade power for their computer. Yeah, okay, for a $700, $900 computer, I'm, I'm not really that fussed about an upgrade path. But if you're investing a lot of money in a workstation, you want an upgrade path. You want to be you able to, yeah. to know that you can get more life out of that workstation. And it's what, for me, has been so satisfying about using the old Mac Pro this year, which I never intended to become my main computer. I bought it as a project for the channel to do the upgrade and I was going to sell it again. But uh, um, I enjoyed using it so much because there's a lot of satisfaction to be got out of using an old machine that you've, you know, I've upgraded the CPU, I've upgraded the RAM, I've upgraded the SSD, I've, you know, worked with the eGPU on a computer that everyone says is non-upgradable. Well, yeah, if you thought that was non-upgradable, wait till you see the new Apple stuff, you know, it's... Yeah. In fact, your 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 Mac Pro is almost like Trigger's broom for those who know the reference. If you don't, if you don't know, do a, do a YouTube search after you've finished watching the podcast. Do a YouTube search for Trigger's broom, and uh, have a few minutes of entertainment, uh, British British style. Hmm. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah basically, is the only part of that Mac Pro that is original is probably the case, yeah. maybe the motherboard. Um, <laughs> does make me chuckle, but yeah, no, it's it's true. It, there's a lot of satisfaction from that. And you've seen that Apple have changed the direction. I mean, even with the the iMac, the only thing you can upgrade is the is the memory. Mm. Um, and it will be and interesting. that's only on the larger one too. You can't do it on the little one. That's very true as well. So only on the twenty seven inch. So it will be very interesting. We're going to be talking about the new the new designs that we've heard rumours of this week in a minute. But it will be interesting to see with some of those whether there is anything user serviceable in them if you can upgrade anything i'm going to bet no well it's just not going to lend itself to that is it system on chip and having the ram there right next to the system on chip it's it seems unlikely so what i really hope to see from the next generations of apple silicon is to have additional ram so additional yep. system ram that is upgradable uh, to maybe have the system on chip being able to be upgraded I think mean, that's incredibly unlikely, folks. Okay, it's not going to happen, but it'd be nice to see it. Um, and I do think we need to see GPU. Um, I, you know, this uh, these computers are not going to be the complete story. So, uh, can we talk about um, 
actually, before we get on to, to what I wanted to talk about, which is my, my current workstation, I just want to say as well, something that's really irritated me about the M1, and that is the the total farce of the Thunderbolt ports or USB oh. ports. Yeah, we because, did a test on those, didn't we? Yeah, and no joke, folks, these ports are slow. I mean, it was about 25% slower using a Samsung T5 drive. But when I connect my Mac Mini up to my RAID disk array that I've got under the desk here, um, which is traditional spinning disks, but they're fast disks and they're connected together in a RAID stripe. And that makes them perfectly fast enough over USB to edit 4K Blackmagic raw video. Yep. And I have used to do that on my Mac Pro. I do that on my new editing rig. No problem yep. at all, but the M1 is too slow. It doesn't work. Because you've got this bottleneck in the USB connectivity. Well, yeah, whatever it is. I, I don't know what's causing it. Do you think it's deliberate? I mean, we know that Apple must know it about it but do you think it's deliberate or do you think it's it's a cost you know there's a chip set in there that's been based on cost to keep the cost at a certain level for this first tranche of apple silicon or do you think it's a deliberate thing um without getting into loads of detail on it i i wonder whether it's something to do with uh you know because thunderbolt is an intel thing Mm -hmm. and of course there's no intel chip in the in the new M1s, and so they, you know, the whole point of it was it's supposed to become an open standard USB 4 compatible with Thunderbolt 3, but anyone who's messed about with with these devices in any kind of detail will know that it's never quite that straightforward. Yeah. Um, uh, And it just doesn't seem to work very well. I I don't know why, if I'm honest, Pete. I, I can't believe that Apple would deliberately hobble their computer. That doesn't make any sense at all. But there, there clearly is an issue. You know, they definitely were working on eGPU support by all accounts, and then they they took it out. Right. So they 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 obviously couldn't get it working. I mean, it, what, I tried plugging my eGPU into the M1, and it gets recognised. You know, and I'm fairly confident as well. I could put a PCI Express card in that enclosure, and it would work fine. But it w- deliberately won't pick up the graphics card. So Apple have actually switched that off for for some reason. Teething problems with the new architecture, maybe. That that would be my guess, yeah. and I th- I think that's also why you know we've got this silly situation where people are, you know, using DisplayPort splitters and stuff to get to get multiple screens on and that sort of thing. Uh, you shouldn't have to do that. No, not in twenty twenty one. But no. who, um, who the knows? Other thing maybe about the mini. Some- Firmware Sorry, updates. I was just going to say maybe there'll be some firmware updates or something we can look forward to that might might correct some of these issues, assuming they're not you know intrinsically linked to the physical hardware. Yeah, it's, it's entirely possible that that will happen. I I suspect though, and I'm disappointed to say this. You know, we we joke about it a lot about being early adopters and you become Apple's beta testers, um, and it, it's funny because it's true at the end of the day. But you, you'd you like to think that for all of the song and dance Apple made about the M1, that this would have been possibly the opportunity to do something different. Uh, and it seems that that's not the case. A lot of people in the comments are talking about returning theirs because they've had so many problems with Bluetooth. And I've not had any Bluetooth issues with mine, actually. But I, I've had a few. Mm. The, the USB issue is, it, it's not a, it's not a deal breaker. But it's pretty epically disappointing. Um, there was no reason, as well, to to put the five gigabit Type A ports on the Mac Mini. You know, why couldn't they have been ten gigabit Type A ports? It doesn't make uh, sense to me. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see what we get this year and see if some of these things are addressed. And I, I use that term loosely because address suggests that you know they didn't know about it and they're fixing it. But we'll see. But but this is this is the thing with Apple. They'll never admit anything. They'll never talk about anything. They'll never reveal any, anything. Everything's got to be done in clouds of secrecy, and and it's all just a little bit irritating. Um, no, but they will sometimes make decisions, and while they may not necessarily admit to them, they may quietly retire the bad decision a bit later, like yeah, Touch Bar, for example. Or yes, we're going to talk MagSafe, about that in a moment. For example, <laughs> I'm mm. very excited about that. 
So at, at some point, and probably not for this podcast, what I'd like to talk about is something that the the M1 has achieved for me mm -hmm. is that it's it offers performance at uh, a price point that is unprecedented uh, for Mac anyway. You know, when it, when it comes to the to the M1 Mini, uh, the only thing I've struggled with it. Uh, with using it for is video editing. It doesn't really work f for that. I, again, it's that kind of illusion of fast and you're using the timeline and it seems really, really quick. And then you'll, you'll add a couple of things and suddenly it chokes. And then it's when you get to the final render and it's not even hitting 40 frames per second. I, I, uh, I find that frustrating when I know that were I able to plug an eGPU in, it would vastly improve it. It's, it's those kind of things. But because it's so cheap, I can use it for all of the work that I do that needs to be on a Mac, which is, yeah. you know, there are a few things that are, we're tied to Mac OS with. Uh, and it's got a nice small footprint. So I've got a computer on my desk. I don't need to plug my laptop into the screen or anything else. It's right here. Uh, and it's absolutely brilliant. And because of the price point, it's facilitated me being able to, to go down the PC route for my new workstation. Oh, um are we going to reveal more about that, or is that going to be saved for another time? Well, I, I, I'm sure people can put two and two together, and, and because they'll see that I've I've recently posted a review of a PC workstation on the on the main channel. On Have YouTube. you? Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, I will bring some more content on that, and um, I hope I hope our Apple fans will will give that the time of day because it's hmm. it's an interesting story, and I actually think that. We benefit by not tying ourselves to one particular platform. I, I get the best of both worlds, and I've actually really enjoyed, you know, using Windows in anger again. It's got a yeah. lot of good points, and macOS has got a lot of good points. Yeah. And and this is my point. You you can get an M1 so cheap, you can build yourself that super powerful PC or buy a super powerful PC to do specific things or to do your gaming, but then have an Apple for for the other things that that does really well. And because it offers that amazing performance at such a great price, that's yeah. a really compelling argument. And, and and just for the sake of balance, because I think it is important, I you know I have to stress I haven't been doing that much video editing in the last. I've got a bit of fluff flying around. I haven't been doing that much video editing in the past couple of well, probably six to eight weeks, other than what the test we did before lockdown, simply because the restrictions make it very difficult for me to do any kind of video in the studio or, or outside at the moment. Uh, so I haven't been using uh, the MacBook Air, which I'm, I'm using tonight, um, for much in the way of video editing. But what I have been finding is that for my day-to-day -day work in the agency that we run, um, so using spreadsheets, using email, using the web, quite, you know, with lots of tabs open, um, and also GarageBand, uh, that's not part of my job. That's what I've been doing to try and stave off the uh, mind-numbing boredom of lockdown. But um, I, I found that the MacBook Air has been, been great. Um, the only thing that's stopping me making it my daily driver is that I do like the size of my 16-inch MacBook Pro. It, the, the MacBook Air is lovely and it's nice to have as an option, but it's just a bit too wee for me. Um, but for for that sort of day-to-day -day stuff that you use your computer for, it's great. So a, a balanced opinion there, but um, perhaps when I start getting into editing uh, uh, in anger again, which will be in the coming months, then I may find that the MacBook Air just is coming up with the same frustrations you found. Yeah, and, um, you know, again, I'd, I'd like to just be clear on... I'm still blown away by the M1. I don't don't think that I don't think it's a a great machine. It really is. Uh, and honestly, if you're going out to buy a laptop tomorrow, it's very difficult to recommend anything other than an M1 at the moment yeah. for price for performance. Uh, and I'd like to see that change. You know, I just I I think my my sort of disappointment is really with Apple's corporate behaviour and the direction that they're. They're taking things, you know, you get the stonewall silence on issues like the USB issue, the Bluetooth issue. Um, you know, you're connecting it wrong. That was, <laughs> it's, it's the old Apple. It's it's the typical Apple Apple scenario. Um, uh, anyway, I think we probably talked about that enough for for one week. Let's talk about the the new MacBook Pro models because if Apple bring out, 
you know the models like we discussed last week the 14 and 16 inch you, you'd probably be tempted uh, you almost almost definitely i think uh, I'd, I'd look at the 14 inch because the macbook air in the 13 inch is only just too small just it's a personal thing i know a lot of people like that you prefer a smaller laptop i just prefer a slightly bigger one always have done uh, but i'd look at the 14 but the 16 um you know they're talking about it having a mini led screen maybe a thinner bezel so you might even get a bigger sense of a bigger screen there um i would definitely be tempted yeah and where i mean obviously a little bit more news is being leaked again i'm you know who knows whether this is correct or not but what what are we expecting to see well yeah i mean again if you're if you're listening to this podcast regularly you will know this if you're tuning in maybe for the first time you will get to know that we don't do sensationalism it drives us up the wall with rumors and fake videos i was watching one the other day and i had to send it to you didn't i it's just face palm worthy people just desperately trying to get clicks and views from lots of rumor mongering and that's just not us we're not going to do that um it works for some channels but we'd rather have viewers that really appreciate the the quality of the content we're giving rather than it being clickbaity or sensational or what have you can i can i just interject to that point pete don't don't lose your, the thought of what you were going to say but uh, i think this is also another thing that's really affected how i feel about the m1 is the enormous quantity of garbage content that's come out on youtube where people rush their reviews out you know yep focused on all of the positives and no one's prepared it seems to take on the negatives or, or fewer people or even well, in some cases i've seen people post the we were wrong video two weeks later to get even more clicks you know yeah. and it's sort of like what about all the people that went out and bought one off on the back of your recommendation well exactly yeah. um uh, you know it's quite it's quite justifying when you see that because we took our time we took our time to review the m1 we weren't slouches but we didn't just post immediately uh, and when we found things that weren't quite right, we we reported them and actually got not abuse, but got people questioning. Well, how can how can that? No other channel was reporting this. We were saying oh, I was getting some slowdown as as an example, and um, other channels. Oh no, other channels. You must you must be you doing something wrong. And and sure enough, we've been proved right. And we've kind of touched on some of those things today. Is when you start doing more complex edits, the thing slows down. So we're not like that. That. We're not like that sort of channel, and um, I think that's important because you know this is a new channel, though it's associated with constant geek geekery. But if you're finding it for the first time, you won't get loads of sensational stuff from us. But what we do do is collate the rumours, and when when things start to seem credible, then we report on them and give our comment on them, rather than just reporting a list of things and that's it. We talk about how we feel about them. Yeah, and that, that is important. And and when it comes to products, you know, there are no perfect products. You know, the M1 is a fantastic product. Can't say that enough. Well, you know, it is absolutely superb. But it's not perfect. And no. anybody who fails to report on the imperfections of something, I, you know, I question that. We need to report the good along with the bad. And Definitely. what's happened is because because so many people report only the good, we've probably ended up reporting more bad than we would have done otherwise. If everyone was giving balanced coverage, then we'd probably have, maybe, I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Anyway, when, let, let, when it comes let, to rumours, we don't want to, we don't want to get caught up with sensationalism. And, no. Uh, and, and so we don't. And so I, I guess that's our way of very long, ambly preface to the things that we're talking about now, because uh, we're reasonably happy that these are, uh, they're still rumours, but they're, they seem sensible. So, so there was, let's talk of, I mean, the obvious ones are like more USB-C ports. Well, yeah, that's a given. That's absolutely necessary um, yeah. because I'd assume that the 14 inch, and I think we said this last week, would replace the four port 13 inch model, not yes. the entry level two port model. And the 16 inch model obviously also has four ports. So whatever they replace it with, will have to have four At ports. At least so, that. Yeah. So I'd say that's credible. Yeah. Um, you, you've got down here um, that they're bringing back MagSafe for charging. Tell me about yes. that, Pete. Yeah, so um, this was something we were pretty disappointed when they took away. Um, MagSafe was on MacBooks uh, up until, I want to say, 2016, but I'm not entirely sure. But for, it, it, the, yeah, around there. 
for, for those of you that don't know, you had a little magnetic charger that went into a little little port on the side of your MacBook Air or your MacBook Pro. And um, if someone walked by and caught the cable, it would just pull out because it was magnetic. No damage to either the charger or your laptop. A very easy to plop into place, no scratchy scratchy. It was just a nice thing to use, wasn't it? And I got excited because, of course, that's been brought back with the new iPhone. Is using the MagSafe brand, as Apple have now coined it, for for magnetic attachments and charging with the iPhone. But there is talk of it actually coming back to the um, the MacBook, pretty much in the same form factor as as it was. So a, a little pill shaped charging point that goes into your into your MacBook Pro, and reportedly it would be a faster charger. Um, than USB-C, which again would be good. Mm, interesting. Uh, of course, I suspect that will mean it'll only have one port, which will be on one or other side. And one of the great advantages, of course, of the four-port USB-C model is you can charge it either side, and that which is you will useful. still be able to do. Oh, still, so it's still charged through USB-C, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 seems to make well, sense to me. So that that's convenient, isn't it? You might have your MagSafe for out and about because it, it lends itself to that and maybe at your workstation you have your your USB-C that you've already got yeah brilliant so yeah okay I can see that and uh, lots of people are talking about mini LED I mean that that's been on the the cards for a long time and I think we mentioned that last week so that won't surprise us at all yeah um, but rumors coming out of uh, Apple removing the touch bar yes so touch bar came out again i think that was 2016 lots of lots of new max macbook stuff in 2016 and the touch bar was something and, and how did we feel about the touch bar when it when it was announced dave can you remember well i can remember our apple rep you know on our business account getting in touch with me and our, you know sort of getting all excited about it how many are we going to order and i'm like none <laughs> because of course in our studio at the at the time and it's very much still the case i suppose with our staff working from home but our staff tend to use the laptop on a laptop riser with one or two displays plugged into it and then they're using a keyboard and mouse on the desk so they probably can't even see the touch bar let alone reach over and use it in any meaningful way so it's just it's a pointless a pointless thing and i'd rather have function buttons yeah same here and we're not the only ones to feel that way it's just it's it feels very gimmicky for apple um i'm not sure steve jobs would have um would have approved it maybe i'm wrong on that but there are rumors that the new macbooks will not have a touch bar and i think that's a good thing they'll have traditional function buttons again um and who, who uses the touch bar i mean i i use it on my MacBook Pro, I use it to lock it when I'm walking away. And I use it to change the volume because I have to, because that's what mm. the buttons are there for. But I actually really like on the MacBook Air, I haven't got a touch bar, and it's got it's just got firm keys. So the the only thing I like about it, Pete, is when you when you're using Apple Pay and you're going to to put your finger on the fingerprint reader. Yeah. But then just to the side of it, it tells you which card you're paying with and how much you're paying and stuff. And I think that's that's useful because it's right there next to where you're pressing your finger. That's where you want to see that information. Yeah. But that doesn't happen very often. I don't do that very often. Is it, is it enough to justify having it? No, I can't think of anything else. I mean, other than the, the stuff that you have to use it for, like the brightness and the, the volume, uh, I can't think of anything else that I, that I use it for. Because when when they launched it, you had someone. I, I distinctly remember this. You had someone demoing it and saying, "Look, I can I can edit Final Cut Pro using this." And they were almost using it to skim up and down the timeline. And then they had someone using it for Photoshop to change something. Have you ever seen anyone editing with the Touch Bar? It, no, I, I don't doubt that people do do it, but. Um... No, it, it doesn't make sense to me as an input device. Um, no. And and then one of the other, finally, on the MacBook Pros, it does seem that we're going to get more design cues from the iPhone 12, so less curves, sort of more of a flat edge form factor, which I think I think will look pretty pretty um, clement. Yeah, I'm. I'll reserve judgment until I see it. I guess. 
and um, and hopefully then because they're they're taking out the, the touch bar it will be um it'll be cheaper then mm. uh, apple are well known for for you know reducing the price yeah reducing. yeah why not no well they are putting an MLED screen in so um, oh i'm sure that'll, that'll offset it that'll offset yeah. it yeah absolutely mm. um so that that's the macbook pros but interested to see them i if we any more leaks on on release date, or are we still anticipating WWDC for these? Uh, no, no change from what we said last week, which has firmly escaped my brain. Uh, well, I think some people were saying that it's possible that we'll see them imminently, um, but I'm I'm unconvinced by that. But we, I, I think it's if if Apple, you know, came out tomorrow, for example, with the new M1X, uh, that would be pretty poor performance from even Apple, wouldn't it? To, to to bring out something so soon yeah you know people only started getting the m1 machines in november so i'm i'm skeptical that we'll see anything that has something better than an m1 until wwdc and yeah. i would have thought the 14 and 16 inch macbook pros would have to have something better than m m1 to differentiate them yeah that that seems almost inevitable that they're going to have the m1x or maybe the m2 whatever they go with on the nomenclature hmm. so yeah we'll just have to wait and see but um, it will certainly be nice to see a refresh for the macbook pro um, but not as exciting as the refresh that we've been talking about for the imac which we we right back at wwdc last year in 2020 we were we were seeing the the labs weren't we uh, with lots of what appeared to be xdr screens and we wondered then whether that was going to be the new imac format hmm. and of course the imac in its current form has been around do you know how long it's been around uh quite a long time i think i've had pretty much every generation of imac apart, yeah. apart from the angle poise one uh, the, right okay i had a G g3 uh, a g5 an intel white one like the g5 i had the 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 silver one that was more sort of square. Now, when did that? So the you, G5, yeah, the G5 was when the, the core design that we have now essentially started. That was the white plastic case. That was the first one. That was 2004. Yeah. And yeah. then I remember your aluminium one. That was 2007. They switched to the aluminium case. And I think yeah. you had one of the first then. Um, and then, believe it or not, it was way back in 2012 that they went to the curved back one that we have now. I thought it was more recently than that, but it was 2012. Uh, it was because it was fairly early on in our in our business. Because if you recall, we got well, you will recall we got burgled twice, and they they nicked our IMAX. Mm. Um, yeah, my I think I had two nicked. Yeah, yeah, we, 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 had, we had, two, a lot, two, had a lot taken. Two robberies. It was a lot of mm. lot of stuff, and it was pretty gutting. But yeah, they mm. we we had the the thicker bezeled back ones before, didn't we? And then we then we had some of the the rounded ones. So, yeah. Anyway, um, Mark Gurman's Bloomberg's reporting that um, the the new ones are going to, as we suspect, to resemble the XDR monitor with a flat back, slimmer bezels, mm. no chin at the bottom so the big silver block at the bottom with the apple logo on is going to disappear yeah. um and they're saying that they're going to replace the 21 and a half and 27 inch models that we have at the moment now interestingly this is where the rumor mill goes into overdrive some are saying oh so we're just getting more 21 and a half and 27 inch imax but that's not what bloomberg are reporting they're saying these will replace the current 21 and a half inch and 27 inch models. So some mm. are saying they'll be the same size, but to me, replace means it could be this 24 inch, for example, is now the new, is replacing the 21 and a half inch, and this 30 or 32 inch is replacing the 27 inch. So well, some have taken that too far, I think. Yeah, I mean, if you've got a similar footprint, but smaller bezels, you'll get a bigger screen in. So I, I'd expect that we'll we'll have slimmer bezels and a bigger screen. Um, I think that Apple couldn't, and I can't remember if we said this last week or not, I don't think they can upgrade the smaller one before they upgrade the larger one. Unless what they're putting in the smaller one is only the M1 chip. Yeah. Um, and I think, it, and again, I'm, I'm sure we may have said this last week, I think if they're going to do that, what they do is use the existing chassis for that 
because yeah. otherwise who's going to go and buy a 27 inch iMac and people do need to go and buy 27 inch iMacs because they're utterly fantastic computers mm. at the end of the day and I, why would apple want to to chop that out of their market um no. before they need to so i my feeling is i think this is very credible i think resembling the xdr monitor apple are trying to standardize their design language um and it, it makes perfect sense that it would look like the xdr monitor and news in folks they will probably come with a stand <laughs> of course you can I, buy you can buy any iMac without a stand yeah you now. can yeah you, you can. get the visa mount version so uh yeah, don't recommend you do one. that i bought i bought one by accident once. <laughs> and we had to go out and buy one of those that's a really things. funny conversation um so that iMac i just bought yeah, we need to go and spend out on a, a, a mount now. But it wasn't $1,000, so at least no, that, there's that. Um, so, yeah, hopefully they will come with a stand. And we, we mocked the XDR for not having a stand, but there are actual reasons why you can see the argument for not giving it a stand. So Yeah, um, but the kind of market that that display, the, the big XDR display is targeted at, those people don't tend to buy stands. No. Um, but it's ridiculous that the stand that they... That, it costs so much. That's that's the the issue. It's not that they haven't included a stand. It's that they're charging a thousand dollars for it. It is, but you know, Apple Apple need to you know keep the bank and keep an eye on that bank balance. Um, they do. And so also the Mac Pro Bloomberg have been talking about. They have, yeah. So they're talking about two versions being in development, which this raised my mm. eyebrows at first. First is a direct replacement for the current 2019 Mac Pro using the same case design and likely to still be using Intel chips. So what they're which, talking about is a is a refresh of the latest generation chips then. Yeah, and at first I raised my eyebrows at that and thought, what? But actually when you think about it, when Tim Cook when Apple announced at WD, WWDC last year the transition to Apple Silicon, Tim Cook said there's still some great Intel Macs on the way. And we did have some but um it makes sense for the apple pro to be one of the last to have a, a refresh with intel chips because we know there's many professionals out there at the moment that just aren't ready to transition they're just not ready to move to apple silicon mm. so it it makes sense that they're developing one whether people will buy it i suppose if they have to if they need to they will um but it makes I sense think... that they are they're doing that yeah it could potentially make sense if they if they were bringing out a dual socketed version, because something I will say, and I'm going to touch back to my PC workstation here. Uh, my PC workstation has a, a Threadripper Pro in it, which is a 32 core professional grade processor. Uh, and it offers performance fairly well beyond the top 28 core Xeon that's available in the 2019 Mac Pro. And it does so at considerably less money. Um, so, there are much faster workstations becoming available. And bear in mind that there is a 64-core version as well yep. of the, the Threadripper Pro. Um, you've also got the Epic chips from AMD. Um, you know, there are you can go to HP or Dell or Lenovo or any of these manufacturers and you can get a dual socket Xeon workstation that will offer performance that the Mac 2019 Mac Pro can only dream of. So if Apple were, were going to push push on with Intel to see them add a second socket so you can get a dual CPU system, get that core count up, you know, get a 56-core model out there, I could see professionals would buy that even now. Yeah. I, I guess the only pause for thought they'll have is, you know, how long are Apple going to support Intel Macs? And, and that's that's a big question. But for mm. a professional, if Apple say we'll support it for another five years, then a business would just make a decision based on that, and they'll just, you know, they'll they'll spread the cost over the five year period and work out whether or not they feel that's that's reasonable. Yep, and they won't really exactly. care what happens beyond that because they'll dispose of it. So, yeah, so it, it it's a numbers game, isn't it, for them? Mm. Um, but then on on top of that, Bloomberg is saying that there's a second version of the Mac Pro in development using Apple Silicon. So the first foray of a, a Mac Pro using Apple Silicon. Um, and what we mostly know about this is the design uh, is going to be about half the size of the current Mac Pro case, mainly aluminium, 
uh, and taking a lot of design cues from. Do you remember the old Powermac G4 Cube? Certainly do. Oh, oh, that was that was a thing of beauty, wasn't it? It was like a, a glorious ice cube, big yeah, one. Yeah, didn't really work, but yeah, it was a thing. Yeah, of but it looked. I, I really mm. want one actually for the <laughs> studio to just make are, it look pretty. There are plenty of broken ones around. You. <laughs> <laughs> um, so perhaps a lower cost entry point for those who perhaps want to start transitioning to Apple Silicon. Um, yeah. What do you think? Um, enough people have been talking about it for us to think it's credible enough to consider. I think this is more more likely than the, the than a, a new Intel version. I think a hmm. refreshed Intel version makes sense um, because it's easy to do and it will keep people happy. Um, half the size of the current Mac Pro. Uh, yeah, I... I'd be excited to see that, particularly if it offers some PCI Express slots and a measure of upgradability. Um, and for that reason, if that's what it's going to offer, then I would suspect that we won't see it immediately or imminently, I think is the term I'm looking for. But I could I could be completely wrong on that. But Yeah, in- we'll, have to, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see it, but I'd, it, I think that's the most tenuous of the things on our list to be honest Pete I'm I believe well, we were I talking about a half size cheese grater weren't we that, mm. that's what we thought but um yeah like like you say we'll have to see the, the certainly the first Mac Pro that uses Apple Silicon will be a, a thing of great interest for all the reasons we've talked about and we'll probably talk about again ad nauseum um, well there's uh, look at the end of the day they got a desktop uh, machine here with the with the mini and there's plenty of space inside this box you know True. there's hardly any space taken up by the current m1 chip so uh, if apple were just going to make a non-upgradable desktop box they have a chassis for that so if it's going to be that much bigger you'd like to think that there's going to be a, a gpu in there and the question is whose gpu mm, salivating but prospects you can see them selling like hotcakes in every web studio around the land can't you if if uh if they do offer some GPU excitement, yeah. we 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 may may have to pick up one or two for sure. Mm. Uh, we need to uh, we need to bring things to a conclusion. So we let's do. just quickly talk about a potential new monitor. Yeah. So obviously the Thunderbolt display was discontinued in 2019, and we missed that. That was a lovely thing. 2016. Sorry, what did I say? 2018. 2019. 2019. 2016. Uh, that was a 999 dollar monitor but it was glorious it was wonderful uh, and then they they got rid of it we had that silly lg thing for a time that apple oh. reckoned I still was great. Saw those. Oh, still those. is that the one that interrupted wi-fi for people oh um, well it did did for a while yeah i think they uh, fixed that and then of course we got then the xdr screen which is just like crazy money and is not really targeted targeted at consumers but um, it looks like this new monitor that they're developing is a consumer slash prosumer model. Obviously, it's not going to have the same brightness and contrast ratio of the XDR, but it will probably still be amazingly gorgeous for us mere mortals. Um, don't know how much it's going to be yet, but probably around about the price point of the Thunderbolt display seems like a sensible point. Sub sub thousand dollars makes it psychologically attainable for people. Maybe don't know be interesting to see and it will probably sell like hotcakes which is good because apple's bank balance as i've mentioned probably in every podcast is a a concern and poor old tim's pension i I think we talk about that far too much we need to find some new apple money related gag yeah um i i think this is very credible um the lg displays are nice but um i don't mean apple never likes that kind of thing um, so I suspect they they would quite like to bring out their own display again. Uh, would I go and buy one? Uh, probably not. Um, I'm very keen, as you know, on the Dell Ultra Sharp screens. I think they give excellent value f- for the money. So Apple really does need to do something pretty pretty great, uh, and I suspect it will be great. I mean, if it's if they just took the 5K display out of the 27 inch iMac and put that in a nice enclosure and sold it for a thousand dollars, then yeah. Ask Great. me if I'd buy one, Dave. I know I already know the answer to this, but would you buy one? Please? Yes. Would you also buy a Yves Saint Laurent lipstick yes. printer? Excellent. Yes. Glad we got not, the truth out of from, you in the end. Not for my own use. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> anyway, um, I think we probably ought to bring it to a close today because we're rudely at one one hour and um, people have lives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although perhaps in lockdown, you know, this is maybe the highlight of the week for some people. And, and if it is the highlight of your week, then we're really, really sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Um, uh, thanks, everybody, by the way, for um, coming over to the new channel. Uh, obviously, yeah. we've taken a hit on the, the viewer figures which we knew we would um and we did say last week that we were going to put a video on the main constant geekery channel just to explain why we'd move the podcast uh and we didn't do that although we did shoot it we but did when shoot i it. when i came to but edit it, it i just thought it was rubbish so we, we didn't um so to cut a long story very short um youtube doesn't seem to be able to differentiate between content that has a smaller audience and content that has a larger audience Obviously, if I release a 10-minute video about Apple Silicon, a lot of people will be quite happy to watch that. Uh, a one-hour podcast with Pete and I waffling along uh, has a, a smaller audience, shall we say. Um, but what happens is YouTube then views that as a failure because it doesn't perform as well as the previous content. So what it does is it stops surfacing your content. So as a smaller YouTube channel, it's been very difficult to get the channel moving because every time I release a decent video... We then scotch it by uploading a podcast, which doesn't do as well as far as YouTube's concerned. So hopefully that helps you to understand why we had to do that. Obviously, big channels don't have to do that because they have such an enormous following and uh, all of their content is surfaced. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But I have to say... Sorry, go on, Pete. I have to say, you know, you've mentioned thank you to all the subscribers that moved over. If you found us through other means, thank you. You're welcome on board. It's really great to have you with us. And if you haven't subscribed to the main channel, that's youtube.com forward slash constant geekery. That's that would be great, too. Um, But thank you also very much for all the comments on the first episode. That was really encouraging to see so much engagement there. So please keep that coming. Um, Tell us what you'd like to see what you'd like us to natter about, what you don't like so much, and we'll we'll try and shape the podcast around uh, our listeners. Yeah. And I'll tell you what we'll do. Uh, we'll set up a, an email address, Pete, um, because we should do that. So uh, let's see. We'll set up podcast at constantgeekery.com. So if you want to submit uh, an idea or something, you know, that you've seen that's uh, that you've found enjoyable, you know, things like Bluetooth, lipstick, you know, stuff that Pete's really interested in, those kind of things. You just fire those over on the email and uh, we'll indeed have a chat about them. Absolutely. And, and give you a shout out as well, obviously. Um, so that, that's it for this week. I, I have no idea what we'll talk about next week. I, maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the nature of the PC workstation because I've got a, a fairly unique situation here in that I'm having to work on two separate machines and that can be quite clumsy, but I found some nice, efficient workflows and indeed equipment that I'd like to share with you that makes that job much easier. Working across multiple platforms, first world problems, if ever there were one. <laughs> but and uh, here's it, another first world problem, Pete. I'm having to spend an inordinate amount of money to have a different bottle of whiskey every week to feature. So, uh, what a problem that must be. I, I, on the other hand, just have a mug of tea or water. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in to the Constant Geekery podcast. Um, Wherever you are in the world, we hope that uh, you're safe and well. And uh, we hope that you'll tune in again next week for episode three of season two of the Constant Constant Geekery Geekery Podcast. Cheerio. Cheerio.